Good morning. Are you guys awake? I was asked to make comments this morning about policy, policy reform. Um, so I'm going to make five points about policy. Danny's right. These are really bright. Um, I'm going to make five points about policy reform. But first, let me tell you a little bit about where this whole perspective came from. Because it's true, um, to Denny's great amusement, my PhD is in systems engineering. So um, I actually come to this as systems engineer. And um, professionally, for the last 20 years, I've been a scholar of strategy and innovation. But that's not why I did any of this. It's not how Mike Porter and I got into this topic at all. When it comes to healthcare, everybody has a story. You do, or you have a close friend or family member or colleague who does. And they're really formative stories for each of us. In this work, it was my stories that drove the impetus for this work in the first place. I have two medically really complicated kids. The first one had open heart surgery in his first week of life. That turned out to be the easier situation. Um, the younger one was chronically ill until he was eight years old. He was in daily pain for six years. I was up eight to 20 times a night, seven days a week for five years before we got a diagnosis. And you know, it's amazing with the correct diagnosis, how quickly a human body can heal and become totally well. I have two polite, kind, funny, high achieving teenagers today. Um, but wow, what a journey. Self-loading baggage. Boy, I'll tell you, we spent months and years as self-loading baggage. And um, it's a really, really difficult journey. I learned a lot of things in that process. But chief among them, the thing that resonated in my mind over and over again is surely we can do better. And that's where we started. How do we do better? A lot better not just incrementally better. So if I think about stepping back and saying, what should we be thinking about? What do we want to be thinking about in terms of policy? Five points. The first is, what's the point of health care reform? I mean, if you look at the newspapers, you're probably sitting there saying, well, is it more care? Or is it less care? Or is it cost reduction? What's the point? None of that's the point. The point of health care is health. Right. So the goal is to improve value, health outcomes, the results for the money spent. My then eight-year-old was looking at my work on the kitchen table at one point and said to me, Mom, what are you working on? And I said, well, I'm trying to figure out how to make the point for people that what you really should care about is value. And he said, as opposed to what? And I said, well, the debate looks as if the purpose were cost reduction. He said, Mom, if the purpose were cost reduction, when I show up for care, they would shoot me. <laughs> right. If the purpose were cost reduction, we'd need painkillers and compassion, and we'd be done. It's value. Health outcomes for the money spent. So that's where we need to be focused. And the good news about that is that Quality, as Denny was talking about in the numerator, and costs in the denominator are interrelated in the following way. Very simply, it is inherently less expensive to live in good health than it is to live in poor health. So when we do things that focus on health as the goal and improving outcomes, we enable results that are inherently less expensive, less disability, less long-term care, fewer complications. Think about a patient with diabetes who doesn't progress to heart failure, blindness, amputation, kidney failure. It's cheaper value. The second point um, that I want to make is about the types of reform that need to happen. As Denny pointed out, the, um, Dr. Cortese, sorry, Dr. Cortese pointed out, the um, the debate in Washington is about insurance reform. 
And we need insurance reform, and that'll be the second point. But understand that we also need reform of healthcare delivery. We actually need health care reform as well as insurance reform. So what's important about the Washington reform? This is the second point. The important thing about insurance reform is that we need everyone in the system for efficiency as well as for equity. Every system in Europe that has universal access to early stage and preventive care is cheaper per capita than ours. That is not a knife edge result. It is not a coincidence. Early stage and preventive care are important to containing our costs um, over the long run. So we need everyone in the system, and it's important to achieve that. Exactly who pays is actually less important. If you look at the systems throughout Europe and Canada, if you look at New Zealand and Australia, if you, um, if you look at the different forms of getting everyone in the system, some of those systems have government payers, some don't, some have only private payers, some have employers involved, some don't. They're all cheaper per capita. We need everyone in the system. But that's not enough, because if we simply put everybody in the system doing things the way we do now, it'll be phenomenally expensive. We have to have innovation in healthcare delivery, or we can't afford to do more. So we have to do better, not just more. Healthcare delivery reform is going to require private sector leadership. We're not going to get that from this wave of political reform. We know that already. So how do we, so the third point is looking to private sector reform for redefinition of healthcare delivery. Just one example so I can be fast in this. I bet you're starting to get hungry. Think about the tidal wave of chronic disease. You know, it's huge and it's growing. Already now, when you ask different companies or you ask the country what percentage of costs is on chronic disease, the answers come in between 65 and 80% on chronic disease. But how is our healthcare organized? It's organized around acute care. We have an incredible strategic or systems mismatch between how we're organized and what we're having to deliver. So we need to think very differently about what's needed to provide effective delivery of, of care for people with chronic diseases. So the innovation needs to be innovation in the structure and organization of care. We hear a lot about waste reduction. That's important, but it's not just waste reduction. I'll be extreme for a minute to make the point, but think about waste reduction. We could take our ability to do amputations and put them in special facilities so that we could do really, really efficient amputation. We could get so inexpensive at it that we could take off both legs of every person with diabetes. It wouldn't be an improvement in value, right? I mean, if you have diabetes, that's not the goal. The goal is to look over the full cycle of care and improve the results, improve the value. And by the way, I don't have diabetes, but if I did, and I had diabetes with um, hypertension and vascular problems, that wouldn't be three diseases, right? That's not three conditions. From the patient's perspective, that's one condition, mine. And there would be a lot of other people who would share that set of circumstances. Today, we're organized around doctor's specialties, but we really need to be organized around this, what the patient needs to get better, to stay better, to be healthier. We talk about healthcare as if it were one word meaning treatment. And we organize around the treatments that doctors give, but actually it's two words, health, and care. And we really want to be paying attention to those. So it's not just a matter of waste reduction, and it's not a matter of fixing incentives. First, the last 15 years have shown us you can't fix the incentives in the current system. You push them down one place, they'll pop up someplace else. You can't fix the incentives in this system. And by the way, no matter how much you make me pay, I can't get the doctors and nurses to work together in coordinated, clinically integrated teams. 
it's not just about fixing incentives. We, can't, we, won't, we won't get there that way. Patient care needs to be more effective and it needs to be easier. We need to be thinking in terms of solutions for patients and families. So it's not just about more primary care docs, um, and it's not about just more on-site clinics or more um, retail clinics. We need to think about solutions from the patient's perspective. New models of care delivery, new roles. The groups that we're working with now are using more educators. They're using more accompaniateurs. They're using more coaches. They're using multidisciplinary medical teams, but they're also extending the definition of what it means to be multidisciplinary into a series of new roles that help people to achieve and maintain health. The next point is that we can um, speed innovation by measuring outcomes. I don't mean processes, I don't mean measuring process compliance, but measuring outcomes um, from the patient's perspective over that cycle of care. A team that's working together on measured outcomes will figure out how to improve those outcomes. And so um, that's one of the things the government really could do would be to insist on measurement and sharing of outcomes by medical teams. They don't need to tell them how yet, and they certainly don't need to use them as report cards. We're not ready for that. I don't know if we ever need to be ready for that. Um, but it's not about report cards. It's about driving learning. We need shared measured outcomes by teams so that we can figure out how we're improving, what needs to improve more, and how to do it better. These, um, we've been working a lot on new models and looking to see what's working. We have now a series of cases that we've developed around new models that, that aren't perfect but are illustrative of things that people are trying. And actually, um, um, Professor Porter and I have developed a course that David asked um, that ask us to, um, to mention, which is on um, new models of healthcare delivery. So it's a care delivery transformation course that we've taught um, at Harvard for the last two years. But we now have a series of, of cases on that that we're working on. And actually, my colleague, Scott Wallace, who's, um, who's here today and available in the um, networking sessions, has been teaching with us in the um, executive uh, version of those, of those courses. Um, and the work that we've been doing now is focusing increasingly on employer initiatives to redefine healthcare in their communities and for their employees. And um, the, the work that we're doing there is working with employers who are getting together with providers to provide new care models in their communities. So it's not just about having an on-site clinic, but about figuring out how do we make it so that the people in our community who have diabetes can get coordinated, integrated care and the kind of support that they need. It, it's, it's not a matter of cost shifting. It's not about how do we get them to think about their health like their money. It's how do we create a culture of health and um, access to care that's, that's better integrated. So for example, there's a project going on um, with um, Michelin and St. Francis where they're working together to create integrated care for what they're referring to as chronic health as opposed to chronic disease for employees with diabetes. And um, so they're moving away from things like, can we provide a service where you get phone support to get your questions answered and asking, what is supportive for a patient with diabetes? How do they, how do they, what are their needs? How do they, how do they succeed? They found that by providing sort of the standard model, they had this lack of fit in the way we were discussing it earlier. They had shift workers who were being called when they were home, having their opportunity, you know, they're on 12 hour shifts. And so they have a different day night schedule when they're on shift. And the, the service that was calling up to provide support was calling between 9 and 5 on their days off, waking them up, not at the best time, not in a way that was helpful. So they started saying, what if we do it from the patient's perspective? What if we do it from the family's perspective? How do we create a community that succeeds better in enabling health? There's another group we worked with 
that in its um, smoking cessation program started off assuming that they needed to provide smoking cessation for their employees and realized very quickly that smoking is a social behavior. So they, wanted, they provided it next to the families and then realized they needed to open it up to the community because if your bowling league is all smoking, you're going to smoke. They've driven the smoking rate in their area from the um, highest rate in the, in the highest, the, the, they were the county with the highest smoking rate in the state. And they are now the county with the lowest smoking rate in the state. Really impressive results. But thinking beyond their own walls, asking not just what do, you know, what are others doing and what are we supposed to do, but what works? How do we achieve this? Um, one of the organizations we work with has been estimating what does it mean to, um, how, how do we succeed with weight loss? And it figured out that when somebody keeps off weight, it's worth $50 a pound in their health benefits. Most of these guys have, decide, have realized that if they put much, much more into early stage and preventive care, doing it very, very differently, they achieve far better long-term results. So the question is, how do we drive you know, significant innovation in health and care so that we're achieving better health outcomes over the long term. Thank you.